Anyone who watches Lars Tharp on the Antiques Roadshow cannot fail to be impressed by the seemingly miraculous way in which he identifies a wide variety of previously unseen objects, giving minute details of their designers, manufacturing processes, and social and economic backgrounds, and then provides the eagerly anticipated valuation, bringing delight or, occasionally, disappointment to the owners. If anyone has a treasured heirloom here today, we're sorry, but the roadshow is closed. Such expertise, though not unique, is rare, and it comes as a result of a combination of a fine intellect, deep study, and a well-developed aesthetic sense. When those are joined, as in our honorand, with great personal warmth and geniality, it is a rare combination indeed. Though Lars was born in Denmark, a country for which he has great affection, it is our good fortune that his family moved to Leicester when he was about six. His secondary school was Wigston Grammar School for Boys next to the university, where he had some contact with the university, playing the cello in our Baroque orchestra, for instance. But Lars, perhaps understandably, opted to go to Cambridge, where he read archaeology and anthropology, and continued his wider engagement in the arts, playing his cello at university level, acting in and producing plays, and running the archaeological field club. At the point of his graduation in 1976, then, we see the emergence of a rounded individual with wide tastes, but there is limited evidence of the future ceramics expert, historian, and broadcaster. The critical development came when Lars, recognising, as he puts it, that there was a dearth of jobs for Paleolithical archaeologists, and conscious of an ability to recognise and remember objects, contrived a meeting with the director of the London auctioneers, Sotheby's. This resulted in an apprenticeship in Sotheby's Chinese department. Lars flourished there, rising by 1983 to be a director himself, and three years later he was invited to join the BBC's Antiques Roadshow as one of its resident experts. He has appeared in all subsequent series, the 2016 series being his 30th anniversary. This has led to numerous other broadcast appearances, including his own 12-part series, Inside Antiques, and something which has particularly pleased him, membership of the winning team of alumni from his Cambridge College on University Challenge. His area of special expertise is ceramics, and particularly the Song Dynasty of 10th to 13th century China, a period of great military, scientific, economic, and artistic innovation, which produced, among other things, the first use of gunpowder, the first banknotes, and what has been described as the foremost expression of ceramic art. Lars has lectured around the world on the subject, and in two BBC films, Treasures of Chinese Porcelain and China in Six Easy Pieces, has described the later development and backbreaking effort of countless labourers employed in the ma manufacture and transport of porcelain to Europe. He has also devised and curated three ceramics exhibitions and is president of the International Ceramics Fair. A genuinely inquiring mind will notice and explore unexpected intellectual byways. And so it was when Lars observed the way in which the 18th century British artist and social commentator, William Hogarth, depicted examples of major ceramic traditions in his paintings and prints. This opened up a field of research leading to a number of exhibitions and books, Hogarth's China, an innovative, an innovative synthesis of ceramic, social, and art history. From this, it was a relatively small step to further work on Hogarth, a television program about Hogarth's love of dogs, vice chairmanship of the Hogarth Trust, and directorship of London's Foundling Museum, Hogarth having been a governor of the Foundling Hospital at its inception. This barely scratches the surface of Lars's activities and public involvement. He lectures extensively around the world. He has served on the jury of the Art Fund's Museums and Galleries Annual Prize, is a fellow of the Society of Antiquaries of London, and a freeman of the City of London. 
Locally, he is actively involved in several societies and charities, including the Leicester Archaeological and Historical Society and the Leicestershire International Music Festival. He championed the National Trust's campaign to purchase and open the beautiful Arts and Crafts House Stonywell, just outside Leicester. His lifelong love of art is matched by his appreciation of music, and if the BBC ever has the good sense to invite him to that well-known desert island, his luxury, if he cannot take a Gainsborough, will be his beloved cello. The other local university was quicker off the mark in awarding him an honorary degree. But at this university, he delivered the Frank May anniversary lecture in 2007, and he looks forward to attending these congregations again next year to see his elder daughter, Helena, graduate as a doctor, satisfying vicariously one of Lars's childhood ambitions. It is, in the best sense, fortunate that he took a different path, or we might have been deprived of his wide-ranging, erudite, witty and imaginative contributions to our understanding and appreciation of so many aspects of culture, art and social history. We honour him for these, for his exceptional communication skills and for his rare ability, as one friend has expressed it, to straddle the academic, commercial and broadcasting worlds without compromise to any one of them. Mr Chancellor, on the recommendation of the Senate and the Council, I present Lars Broholms Tharp that you may confer on him the honorary degree of Doctor of Letters. What a pleasure to do this to you. It really is. You give us so much fun. <laughs> you give us so much fun. <laughs> and I'm thrilled. Yeah, absolutely yeah. thrilled. Thank, Thank you so much. much. Chancellor, Vice-Chancellor, members of the Senate, distinguished guests, parents, carers, guardians, and fellow graduates. Earlier this year, while in Australia and Melbourne, I had to give evidence over a live satellite link to the Court of Chancery in London. The very first question I was asked by counsel for the defendants in my three-hour cross-examination was, Mr. Thorpe, you are not an academic, are you? <laughs> well, see me now, Mr. Grigsby. <laughs> Um, it is truly an honor to be honored by the university of my home city, the, the university, as you've heard, in whose shadow, attending Wigiston Grammar School, I regularly evaded cross-country runs. Uh, the university where my wife, uh, Gillian, was a history student, the university where one of our daughters, as you've heard, Helena, is today studying medicine and where uh, her sister, Georgina, is it currently employed in the Student Recruitment Office, something which will be close to all of your hearts um, three years ago. So I have many associations with Leicester. Actually, my, my home city is ultimately Copenhagen, Denmark, which accounts for my rather Anglo-Danish name, a name with many homophonic variables. Uh, my favorite one being the one which I found on a letter that was sent to me when I was working at Sotheby's many, many years ago, posted in Pakistan. It was addressed to Mr. Large Carp, <laughs> uh, comma, Sotheby's, brackets, world famous auction house, <laughs> comma, England. How's that for reaching, reaching the intended recipient? In fact, in, in my very first visit to China in 1999, I, I noticed that every time I was introduced to a, a, a Chinese lady or gentleman as Mr. Lassup, some of you will appreciate this already, I know, there was a snigger. And, um, and I said to my interpreter, Fume, 
Fume, there's something funny about my name when you render it into Chinese. And she said, oh, no, no, no. I said, there is, there is something I've noticed. You will tell me. And uh, she said, oh, well, your name in Chinese, it sounds a bit like oh, Mr. Urinal. <laughs> I said, okay, okay, Fume, next time I come, I will have a very honorable Chinese name, which I now have. I will tell you what it is. It is, wait for it, it is Su Bolu. As you will know, is a Chinese mythical character who could spot a good horse at a thousand leagues. Sadly, I didn't have a rollover bet on the discovery of the skeleton of a former king, coupled with the likelihood of the local team winning the premiership. If I had, I would be a very wealthy man. Not all universities believe in awarding honorary degrees, but I can assure you, if you are ever offered and intend to work in China, take it. Uh, the more post nominals you have and can put on your visiting card, the more likely you are to overcome uh, the stigma of, of being called Mr. Urinal. <clears throat> In fact, when I give, gave my card to, to my Chinese uh, friends uh, in, in that first visit, they looked, they, they didn't actually spot my name at all. Um, they saw my postnomials, that's what they went for. And so I was constantly being addressed as Mr. Ma Frizza, uh, which uh, I've worked out now, if, having accumulated this great honor, uh, I will now be addressed in China, if they just look to the final part of the formula, it'll be Mr. Ma Dot. The lit fizzer. Um, so we'll have to make sure they know the difference between my name and, and the honours. Speaking of honours, um, I'm, I'm, I'm reminded of a time when I appeared on a television uh, show. Uh, it was an antique show uh, with, some of you won't know this lady, but others will, uh, a lady called Honor Blackman. A very wonderful lady and slightly frightening. An incredible lady, and uh, if you've watched any of the early James Bond films, you would have seen her. Um, and uh, after some hesitation, after we'd done the program, I, 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 I ventured to tell Miss Blackman uh, a little ditty that I'd found in the local pub where I lived, and it went something like this, and, and I, it, it said, she offered her honor, he honored her offer, and all night long, it was honor and offer. <laughs> anyway, um, she gave me a very interesting look after that. Uh, anyway, to be nominated for an honor in recognition of work one has done um, for pleasure is what the Danes would call double confect, uh, or a twice rewarded act. Um, and to be given an honor for doing something that one enjoys doing is, is um, one has to feel an element of guilt as well as of pride. Um, to, to use the Latin uh, phrase, the felicitous phrase, labor ipse voluptas. And I want you to take that with you, labor ipse voluptas, because I think it's quite a good uh, motto to try to hang on to for your, the rest of your working lives. Um, it's the work which is a pleasure in itself. And, and I wish that you may find that form of life yourself. It is important that you decide what you like and what you're good at is also quite relevant. But what you like is very important. You wouldn't like it if you weren't any good at it is my theory. So follow your likes. And um, in my own case, that's what I did. As you heard, I came out of university with a, a degree in Paleolithic archaeology. It's amazing that I wasn't snapped up. Um, I think there were two interviews I did in one year for a post for which I was relatively reasonably qualified, where all my other co-interviewees were, in fact, at PhDs. So, um, Follow what you like and find out what it is that you're good at. You will know that by now. You've had three years, and, and examining those things uh, is very important. 
Um, we've already had mention of Richard III, but I couldn't help putting in this one because it was told to me by the very distinguished former Bishop of Leicester, who does a lot of lecturing on cruises, and this is one he threw at his audiences there. Um, Timothy Stevens. Now we have found the body of Richard III. The search is on for his horse. <laughs> and we will be digging up the car park at Tesco's, which I thought was a very neat way of conflating two very popular news stories at the time. And um, I should just say, in terms of honors, one, one has to take honors with a certain uh, modesty. Um, one mustn't be over-seduced by them. I discovered this when I was invited by my college at Cambridge to participate in University Challenge. I'm sure some of you watch, or indeed have participated yourselves in University Challenge. Uh, so the oldest team, which is the one I was expected to join, uh, went on at Christmas two years ago. and. Contrary to all of our expectations, we won. We are the champions of 2014 Christmas show. So my college was so chuffed that we all got invitations to go to a very prestigious annual dinner at college where we were given points of honor around the master. Um, and during the meal, everybody was in white tie. It was a, a fantastic occasion. Um, and then um, at, at, towards the end, the master got up and he said, um, well, ladies and gentlemen, as, as you will know, I'm not much given to public speaking, um, but I, 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 I'm, I know that you would like to know some of the achievements we've had over the last six months or so. Um, yes, so Maximilian Hildesheimer has been awarded a Nobel Prize for his work on the migratory patterns of the crested grebe. Oh. Silent approbation, a slight ruffle of, 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 uh, of enjoyment. Yes, and Ronald Courchert has been knighted for his work on Mesolithic middens. Oh, <laughs> approval all round. Our college first eight rowing team are head of the river. Oh. <laughs> and uh, in the last few months, we uh, have the alumnus team of the college has won University Challenge. Hooray! The approbation was amazing, and uh, I felt sorry for all of those people who really had worked hard for their honours to be slightly overtaken in applause by, uh, by the University Challenge team. We can all say that none of us would be here without our parents and the families which have nurtured us and lived with our trials, successes, and failures. My own parents, Harry and Anne-Marie, who are here today, have supported and stayed with me throughout all of the vicissitudes and changes of direction in my own life. And, um, and my wife, Gillian, continues to deal with moments of crazy absent-mindedness uh, and, 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 and strange ideas and, and plans. Uh, and I have a, a huge debt uh, to thank them for in, um, in my life. Uh, but going back to my early childhood uh, in Copenhagen, it was my Danish grandfather who, who, I guess, put me on the road to what I do today, which is looking at stuff, um, in particular ceramics and pottery, crockery, if you like. Um, my, my own grandfather uh, uh, graduated from Copenhagen University just around 1920, and he came out of that university with a degree in classics, uh, as did approximately... I don't know, 70 or other graduates in classics. Um, so it was not an easy time for him, but he was very lucky he got an invitation to join as a junior member um, the National Museum of Copenhagen, one of uh, Europe's very greatest museums. And there he changed his direction altogether. Um, he became an archeologist, albeit his heart was still in the works of Cicero, um, he became a quite distinguished archaeologist. He charted the Danish Bronze Age, and uh, he became keeper of prehistoric antiquities at the National Museum. Um, it was he, he who dragged me around uh, at a very early age, the museums of Denmark and the corridors, and, and showed me the grisly sights of the bog people. 
He told me the story he'd been actually at the exhumation of one of the bog people, the Graubale man, whose mortal remains, already 3,000 years old, when um, they were put on the stretcher uh, to take, be taken to the Museum for Conservation, uh, were rolling around in the back of this little Danish van. My grandfather sitting there with the Graubale man um, rolling around. <laughs> and he told me the story, can you imagine? as a five-year-old sitting on your grandfather's knee, and he looks at you and he says, and as we went over one of those bumps, one of his eyes opened <laughs> and looked at me. A blue eye that hadn't been opened for 3,000 years. And if you're interested in visiting the Graubelle man, he's in Aarhus or just south of Aarhus today. You can check out that story. And I do believe that uh, my grandfather was telling me the whole truth when he told me that. So I came out with a degree in archaeology, and I knew that I was good at recognition and vis visual memory. And that was my lifeline. And I thought backwards, really, and I thought, what do I want to do? I want to do something that um, looks at stuff. And that's what I've ended up doing. I've been looking at Chinese works of art now for um, a good 35 years, and I continue to enjoy it. I continue to have a, an intake of breath when I see a particularly beautiful object, but it's not just the object, it's where the object takes us. And uh, those of you who've got your archaeology or heritage degrees will know this, my great patron saint of stuff is Neil McGregor, the outgoing director of the British Museum, uh, who manages to do precisely this. He takes a boring object and he will take you to an exciting part of history which is just sitting there in a tile or in a piece of silver or in a little piece of fabric. Um, go to the Foundling Museum where I was director and you will see the fabrics of the women who hoped to find life for their babies by giving their babies to the Foundling Hospital from the 1740s onwards. And in order to retrieve their babies, they were asked to give a little token, a piece of fabric, which was pinned into the certificate when the child was brought, and through which that mother might, should she be able, might be able to reclaim her child in years to come. Incredibly poignant things. A, a, a piece of fabric that you wouldn't look twice at, but given the context, suddenly, suddenly, um, you are brought into another world, a world which, dare I say, the written word, the written word cannot sometimes conjure with quite such a vivid power. So, um, yeah, I've, I've become what is called an expert. None of us on the roadshow likes actually being called an expert because it implies being infallible. And fortunately for us, all the art world is far more ambivalent, ambiguous. People make mistakes all the time and go mopping up after other experts. And even after being seen for 30 years on the show, reading the ruins on the Antiques Roadshow, not all of our clients believe what we tell them. Um, and I'll just illustrate this. This is fame for you. This is being an expert for you. My colleague, Eric Knowles, was on his home territory in Lancashire. He told his client um, everything and more that can be said about her Tiffany glass. Everything. And as the facts mounted, um, the owner seemed less and less impressed. And after Eric's five-figure valuation, she wrapped up the vase, put it back in its box, left the table, and as she passed the next person in the Antiques Roadshow queue to come to Eric, she said in a loud stage whisper, that young man knows bugger all. <laughs> now, our clients, whether on the roadshow or in the museums, are right to question the opinions of experts. You have been trained to question all opinions, and may you long continue to do so. Um, now that I've been honored in this lovely way, uh, Whenever my opinion is put into doubt, I shall, Mr. Chancellor, reply by speaking those chilling words, doubtless uttered by Bodkin Adams. Trust me, 
I'm a doctor. 